sure we've all been looking forward to tonight's uh, tonight's presentation. Um, very pleased to uh, welcome to the uh, to the webinar um, Jacqueline Mitten. Um, Jacqueline's uh, been an author and presenter on astronomy for many years, a past editor of the BA Journal as well, uh, um, some, some time ago, I think. Um, um, but um, she's going to talk to us this evening uh, about the astronomer Vera Rubin. Um, probably um, it's only really been in the past few years that uh, people have uh, started to realise the contributions that she's made to astronomy. And it's been quite a remarkable uh, life, as it says in this uh, in this title slide. So I think without any further ado, we'll pass over to uh, uh, Jacqueline uh, to talk about uh, Vera Rubin, the life and legacy of a remarkable astronomer. Thank you, um, Callum. And um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, uh, hello to everybody who's listening. It's a slightly strange experience giving a webinar to um, a computer screen when I'm used to talking to a room full of people. So I hope you'll forgive me if it, if it doesn't sound like I'm in front of you in the same way as if I'm in the room, but I'm doing my best and I'm on a learning curve, as they say. Well, my talk this evening is about one of the most famous, um, well-known um, uh, as female astronomers of the last 50 years, Vera Rubin. I've been spending the last three years researching her life going through boxes and boxes of her documents in the US Library of Congress, visiting the places where she worked and talking to her family and former colleagues. As you can imagine, it's going to be difficult to cover a long life and such an enormous contribution to astronomy in around 40 minutes, but I'm about to try. So this is my plan for the rest of the talk. I'm going to begin with her early years and uh, her passion for astronomy, how it was inspired and her struggle to establish her own career. And then I'm going to look at her research on the internal dynamics of galaxies. And that will inevitably lead us on to how dark matter comes into her story. W once her career was established, Rubin's other great passion and, and mission in life was improving the lot of women astronomers. So no talk about her would be complete without something on that. And then in conclusion, I'm going to say a few words about why I think she was such a, a remarkable astronomy, as astronomer. And I, I hope I will have persuaded you too. So to Vera's early life. She was born in Philadelphia in the United States. Her grandparents had fled from the persecution of Jewish people in Eastern Europe at the end of the 19th century. And they changed their family name to something that sounded a bit more um, English or American to Cooper. When Vera was about 10, her family moved from Philadelphia to Washington DC where Vera would spend almost the whole of her life. Now, Vera discovered the stars through her bedroom window. She was fascinated by their daily motion. And her father was a graduate in electrical engineering and he supported her burgeoning interest. He accompanied her when she wanted to go to meetings of the local astronomy club. And she borrowed books from the library and read what she could when she was 15 years old, her father helped her to construct a simple homemade telescope, which is what you can see here. She admits it wasn't a great success, but it was fun, as Vera said. She, it was one of her favourite words. Everything for Vera was fun. And she had better success, though, when she just gave up on the telescope and um, exposed the, her camera to the, star, to the sky and photographed star trails. This is one that she carefully preserved and you can see there um, it was on October the 5th in 1943 facing north uh, for two hours. So and while actually while we're on these uh, images on this screen I would just like to acknowledge now my gratitude to both the Carnegie Institution of Washington and to the Rubin family for permission to use these images and a number of others in the, in the presentation. 
Now, at school, Vera, you might think, was going to shine at science. Actually, it didn't happen quite like that. She encountered sex discrimination for the first time. The problem was with the physics teacher who really put her off physics. And he told her that she'd do okay if she kept away from science. Fortunately, the teacher didn't put her off astronomy, but she was determined when she applied to go to university that she wanted a course where she could major in astronomy rather than physics. She was awarded a scholarship, which she needed, the family weren't well off, um, to, uh, to study at Vassar College in New York State. Now this was where America's famous, very first female astronomer, Maria Mitchell, was the foundation professor of astronomy. You can see her here, um, looking quite sort of formidable as she often did uh, um, in front of her telescope. Uh, and Vassar College still, when uh, Vera went there, had a very strong tradition in teaching practical astronomy uh, that was uh, set up first by Maria Mitchell. So as World War II ended, um, the 17 year old Vera, this is 1945, embarked on her three year degree course. This was a photo of the observatory she took when she arrived and um, she stuck it into her photo album, pages of which are still being preserved by, by the family. Now at um, Abbasa College, her main teacher was Maud Makemson. Uh, all the time since Mariah Mitchell, uh, the, the, the professors of astronomy had all been women uh, who succeeded. And um, Maud Makemson was, uh, it was in charge of the astronomy department when Vera arrived. Her expertise was in the mathematics of orbit calculations and in archaeoastronomy. And under Makemson, Vera gained a very solid training in the basics of astronomy. And she was also able to do some practical astronomy, as you can see here in the, the picture on the right hand side, or rather post but it did reflect what she was able to do. Makemson was also a very great enthusiast for uh, celestial globes and atlases. And this was a passion that Vera came to share. Makemson gave Vera one of the globes that she no longer wanted to keep in her collection. And it was the start of a very serious collection that, uh, uh, um, Vera uh, acquired throughout her life. And in fact, looking at these two pictures, I'm fairly convinced it's the same globe. And I think that maybe Vera posed for that picture much, much later, deliberately choosing the one to copy that lovely picture of Maud Makemson. In the summer of 1947, when she was just 19 years old, Vera met Robin Robert Rubin. He was the son of neighbours in Washington and at the time he was a graduate student in physical chemistry at Cornell University in New York State. It was absolutely love at first sight. In a few months they were engaged and they were married as soon as Vera had graduated from Vassar. Vera and Bob shared a very deep interest in science and a desire to raise a family. Now, Bob was very good at mathematics, physics, and chemistry, and he was enormously supportive of Vera. Well, the marriage settled Vera's plans for what she could do next. She signed up for a two years master degree at Cornell to be with Bob, but the astronomy department there was very tiny and did very little apart from teaching basic classes. The head of the department there was this guy, um, one Professor R. William Shaw. Sadly, Vera took an instant dislike to Shaw, which was unfortunate because she had to work as an assistant to him to pay her way. Um, he was rather aloof and it, she certainly put her off uh, to begin with by suggesting that she might be better off doing something 
other than astronomy, not a good way to start out. However, according to Ruben's uh, Cornell records, Shaw thought quite highly of her. And uh, you can see here, he writes on one of her reports, excellent progress on a very original thesis. Um, and indeed she was very successful. She, uh, she completed her master's degree. But that wasn't entirely thanks to Shaw because her main teacher and advisor was this lady, Martha Stair, who became Martha Stair Carpenter after her marriage. Stair was an expert on the dynamics of galaxies and Vera was very inspired by her lectures. For most of her course, though, Vera's um, other supervisor in physics was the charismatic, charismatic physicist Richard Feynman, who was subsequently to become a Nobel um, laureate. Mind you, she did find his lectures on quantum electrodynamics a bit challenging. By the end of 1950, then, Vera had taken her master's degree and she'd given birth to her first son, Davy. And now the future was very uncertain and she had no plans at all. Through 1951, Vera became deeply unhappy. Something had to be done. There was just one place in Washington where she could enroll for a part-time PhD. And this was Georgetown University, a Roman Catholic foundation run by the Jesuit order. It had a small but well-established astronomy department and this observatory, which I'm happy to say is my own photograph taken when we went to re research um, uh, the archives there. Already expecting her daughter, Judy, Vera started on her studies in February, 1952. Elaborate plans were hatched so that she could attend the formal classes in the early evenings. Now, twice a week, her parents, here they are, Pete and Rose Cooper, took care of the children, while Bob acted as chauffeur, since Vera herself did not drive. Uh, and it was a very exhausting double life for Vera. Um, incidentally, Bob used to drive down to, from where they lived, to Georgetown Observatory and sit eating his sandwiches in the car park while Vera attended the lectures and he waited to drive her back. Uh, and um, Vera, during those years as a PhD student, was caring for two preschool children during the day. Here's a picture taken just a little later of Vera and Bob with their, their two first children and studying for her PhD mainly at night. She later said that it was the hardest thing she'd ever done. So she was awarded her PhD in 1954. And then again, she was left wondering what she was going to do next to further her career. How would she ever become a real professional astronomy? Um, and she kept her hopes alive by avidly reading the astrophysical journal while teaching part-time at a nearby school. But within a year, she got a better job offer. Now, the head of department at uh, Georgetown University who'd taken her on as a student was um, this guy, Francis Hyden, uh, SJ. Um, he was bringing a tidy income into his department with contracts for the US military involving eclipse observations. In the 1950s, there was a lot of concern in the military about knowing the figure of the earth more precisely. Uh, we're talking about a time before there were satellites, um, but after the invention of intercontinental ballistic missiles. So you can understand why the military were quite keen on this. Um, solar eclipse observations were actually one of the ways of improving our knowledge of the shape of the earth. Now, Father Hayden had fallen behind with delivering his reports um, the top brass were getting a bit cross. There was a mountain of data from an eclipse that had taken place um, in, a, a, um, the track had gone all across Africa in February of 1952. And um, he had the bright idea of hiring Vera. 
Vera, of course, was not particularly interested in this kind of work, but at least she was going to be paid to be an astronomer. And she even managed to extract some astrophysics from the uh, data she was handling. And she managed to publish a paper on solar limb darkening. Now, when the military contracts came to an end, Father Hyden managed to find some funds to pay for her uh, to do some teaching and to carry on with some research. And within a couple of years, she was promoted to assistant professor. Now, some of the things that Vera did between 1960 and 1965 had a direct bearing on her subsequent research on galaxies. For instance, she assisted Gerard de Vaucouleur of the University of Texas, well known in the field of, of galaxies. He'd got a large collection of galaxy photographs and he hoped that photometric scans, that's, here's an example of one uh, of that galaxy that you can see there. He'd hoped that scans like this one of NGC 4945 might lead to some general conclusions about galaxies that would then help determine their distances. Now Vera admired de Vaucouleur and she liked the idea of working on galaxies and she got the necessary equipment at Georgetown so that they could collaborate by correspondence. And de Vaucouleur tempted her with the promise of joint publications, but not a single paper ever appeared with Vera's name on it as an author. One might ask why that was. It must have been a great disappointment, even though the experience of working on galaxies with de Vaucouleur's was certainly useful. At the same time, Vera was teaching galaxy dynamics to a class of her able graduate students, and she set them a problem. Could they find new information on the rotation of the Milky Way from data um, in existing catalogues? The answer was yes. The, um, the results that they got were published in the Astronomical Journal in 1962. And their paper included this rotation curve. Now, a rotation curve is a graph, a simple graph showing the star's rotational velocity around the center of the galaxy against their distance from the center of the galaxy. Now, their data are the dots with the error bars. And they were surprised to find that the rotation curve flattened out with distance when the general expectation at the time was that the velocities would keep falling with distance, <coughs> as shown here in this schematic. <coughs> so you can see by comparing their results with that, that what they observed was not what people at that time expected. Now, most of the mass in galaxies appears to be concentrated towards the center if you judge it from where you can see the brightness of visible stars and gas. And if the mass is where light is emitted, then the rotation curve should fall. <clears throat> now Rubin and his students checked um, but for sources of error, but they couldn't find anything, no explanation, but no one believed them. They were told they must just have got it all wrong. Much later, of course, it turned out they were right. Um, and this was the very first time that Rubin found a flat rotation curve. But even she soon forgot about this one. <coughs> now, apologies for my rough throat. Vera spent the academic year 1963-64 in California working with Margaret and Jeffrey Burbage at the University of California in La Jolla, while her husband Bob took up a fellowship. Now we've got to remember that back in these early 1960s, very little was known about galaxies at that time. It's hard to believe now, including such basic matter, things as their masses which you can calculate if you've got a rotation curve. 
So the Burbages were running really a production line in galaxy rotation curves in collaboration with mathematician Kevin Prendergast. Now from working with them, Rubin learned about measuring galaxy rotation curves and how the data could be analyzed to find the masses of galaxies. And she learned about the practicalities of measuring spectra and, and Margaret Burbage became a lifelong friend. With this collaboration, she was rewarded with publication. She co-authored nine papers in the Astrophysical Journal between 1963 and 1964. You can see the title here of one of them. This was a very significant year for, for Vera, and not only because of this, but for another reason too. She finally got her first taste of observing as a professional. Helmut Abt, um, a, a staff astronomer at Kitt Peak National Observatory, which had very recently been established, encouraged her to apply for observing time on the only telescope that was operational, which was this in this dome, housed in this dome called the number one 36 inch. And she was allocated five observing sessions over, over a period of, of 13 months. As well as that, Margaret Burbage promised that Vera could join them on one of their observing sessions at the 82 inch Otto Struve telescope at the MacDonald Observatory in Texas. And she was able to take that offer too. So for the first time she experienced observing and she discovered she liked it. But the most exciting opportunity of all came her way in the summer of 1964 when Alan Sandage, the famous observational cosmologist, asked Vera whether she would like to observe at one of the Carnegie observatories in California, that was at Palomar or at Mount Wilson. Now this was significant because no woman had ever been allowed to do that officially, nominally because of the lack of a toilet and accommodation facilities. Some 10 years earlier, however, Sandage had also used his influence so that Margaret Burbage could observe with Jeff when he, notice he, was being allocated the time at Mount Wilson. She wasn't allowed to apply for the time. But now Sandage wanted to help Vera. And under Sandage's guidance, Vera successfully applied for time on the 48-inch Schmidt telescope at Palomar. And when she went in December 1965, you know, the same even at Palomar for all of us, the first night was cloudy. And um, so she was given a tour by two astronomers who were due to observe on the 200 inch. One of them's uh, here in this picture with her. Um, and the tour took her bow past a door labeled men, which she was told was the famous toilet. And the next time Vera went to Palomar, which was about five years later, she cut out a paper skirt and taped it to the male figure on the door. This was became a very famous story about Vera. Now, earlier in 1965, before the trip to Palomar, Rubin had made a very big decision. She felt she needed to leave Georgetown. But she had no job to go to, but she did have somewhere in her sights. The Carnegie Institution's Department of Terrestrial Magnetism, or DTM for short, was conveniently close to where she lived. Now it's curious historic name dates from 1904, but it had changed into a research institution where scientists pursued a very wide range of different things, including one or two doing radio astronomy. Now, Vera knew one of these radio astronomers, Bernie Burke, and she was interested in the idea of comparing optical and radio observations of the Milky Way. She used to go there to, to chat to him from time to time, and she loved the atmosphere, calm and in a semi-rural setting. So Vera marched in and so being a Bernie outright that she'd like to work there. 
Bertie said later he, he couldn't have been more shocked if she'd asked him to marry him. But he got over the shock and he invited her to stay for the community lunch and he introduced her to this guy, Merle Tuve, very famous physicist, who was the director at the time. Now, at the lunch, she was also introduced to um, this young man, a, an instrument physicist by the name of W. Kent Ford Jr. For several years, um, Ford had been playing a major role in a pioneering project at DTM. Um, he was developing an astronomical spectrograph that included an electronic image tube. This was really cutting edge stuff. They now had a working prototype and it increased the sensitivity to light by a factor of 10. There was only one small problem at DTM. They didn't have any optical astronomer on the staff to work with Ford and properly test out the capabilities of a spectrograph from the perspective of the people who were really going to use them, an observer. So Vera couldn't have turned up at a more opportune moment and she was hired. Now she could devote herself to observing and she got access to this cutting edge instrument. In fact, she stayed at DTM until she was 86 years old and couldn't continue because of her failing health. During 1965, she worked at four different observatories, used five different telescopes in six different observing sessions. And this pretty well set the pattern for the rest of her professional life, which resolved almost entirely around her observing allocations. Vera often said she was never happier than when she was in the dome. And colleagues said that they'd never come across an observer who worked with such dedication. She planned and executed her observations very meticulously, and it was a great matter of pride for her that other astronomers would regard her published data as completely reliable. Now, Rubin and Ford bonded as professional colleagues right from the start, and Ford remained Rubin's collaborator until he retired when he was 60. In the first couple of years, they tested out the capabilities of the spectrograph as they were required to do on a variety of fainter objects, such as quasars, which had only very recently been discovered, of course. But once that was done, Ruby wanted to settle on a long-term systematic observing programme, something ideally that no one else was doing, so she wouldn't be in competition. So they decided to work on the rotation of M31, the, the Andromeda galaxy. With the image tube, they could get spectra of individual luminous gas clouds. It was difficult and very demanding, but possible. Now her friend, another radio astronomer, the radio astronomer Walton Roberts, who worked at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, had done a high resolution radio survey and had plotted rotation curves, which you can see um, here, he found slightly different ones on opposite sides of the galaxy. And neither fell at large distances, as was generally expected. But despite that earlier radio evidence, many people were very surprised when Ruby presented her initial results, which you could see in the, um, uh, the montage at the top superimposed on the optical galaxy image. And uh, they were surprised uh, at this meeting of the American Astronomical Society, which was in December 1968, to see this curve, which flattened out. But at no time, at that time, was anybody really seriously thinking, well, what it meant. They just assumed, well, maybe it would flat, maybe it would start to fall later. And nobody was really giving it much consideration. Well, after M31, Rubin and Ford got diverted briefly into trying to test whether the expansion of the universe was formal, was, was uniform. But they soon went back to galaxy dynamics. Vera's obsession was nicely captured by a very well-known uh, cartoonist at the time, Dean Vitor, regular contributor to the New Yorker, for example. He drew this cartoon at a dinner 
um, where, where Vera was present, he drew it on a paper napkin and presented it to her. It depicts a very puzzled looking Vera standing next to an absolutely gigantic pro trophy that says on it, special award, can't help wondering about all those galaxies award, 1974. Well, he obviously got um, what Vera was all about. Um, galaxies were never far from Vera's mind. She was a great doodler, especially when she was on the phone. And this is probably one of the supreme examples of a page of her doodles, stylized galaxies of every manner you might, uh, you, you could possibly imagine. So when I say she was obsessed by galaxies, there's the proof. Rubin believed that the evolution of galaxies and the reasons for their great variety of forms would only be understood through a systematic study of a large number of them. And by 1976, they got image tube spectrographs on four metre telescopes, both at Kitt Peak and in Chile, and she planned an observing program based on Hubble's classification scheme, tackling in turn types SC, that's the open spirals, types SB, which are the intermediate spirals, and type SA, which are the more tightly wound spirals. And along with a handful of other collaborators, Rubin and Ford produced nearly 50 papers in a decade. Here on the left hand side, you can see a page of typical galaxy rotation curves from one of Rubin's papers. Now, the similarity of all those curves and um, their absolute flatness is truly striking. You can also see on this slide um, some of the uh, uh, photographs that she also published in her papers showing both the galaxies themselves and the raw data of the spectra. Uh, now Ruby knew that radio astronomers had found a number of flat rotation curves, but she didn't feel in competition. She saw her work as an optical astronomer as complementary to theirs. But she didn't concern herself very much with explaining the data either. She left that to others. For certain, she did not set out to look for dark matter or to investigate it. The time eventually came though, when Rubin accepted that she was involved with dark matter. And that leads me on to the next major topic. Now the story of dark matter could be a, a, a talk um, in its own right, uh, but I've only got a brief time. So we get a brief summary just to put in context what Rubin was doing. And we begin in the 1930s. The first person to use the expression dark matter is Fritz Wicke here in 1931. Now he wonders how the Coma Galaxy Cluster manages to hang together. And he concludes it must be hundreds of times more massive than you'd imagine from the physical galaxies. The glue must be gravity. Now he confirms that a few years later um, and uh, Sinclair Smith, pictured here, also finds a similar result for the, for the Virgo cluster of galaxies. In 1939, Jan Oort finds that the spindle galaxy, NGC 3115, is far more massive than it looks superficially, and that the invisible stuff is distributed differently from the luminous stuff. He works out that 99.5% of the galaxy's mass is apparently invisible. He thinks it must be, though, in the form of very faint dwarf stars or interstellar gas and dust. Nobody's really thinking beyond that in the 1930s. And I'm now going to make an enormous leap forward 30 years to the 1970s, when things really begin to move forward quickly. In 1970, the Australian theorist Kenneth Freeman says that M33 and NGC 300 must contain at least as much invisible matter as detective matter, and that those two types of matter have got to have very different distributions. 
Then in 1973, Jeremiah Ostreicher and James Peeble, who are theorists, come up with the stunning conclusion that the only way that galaxies, disc-shaped, spiral-shaped galaxies, um, can exist and remain stable is if they are surrounded by a massive spherical halo of something. And the next year, along with Amos Yahil, they look more closely at the astronomical evidence for massive halos, such as flat rotation curves. And they point out the implications for the total mass of the whole universe. The general assumption around this time though is still that the material response will probably turn out to be ordinary matter, something that's just too dark or dim to detect. I can remember around that time in the 1970s that people used to joke about maybe the universe was full of house bricks or IBM typewriters or something. Um, of course, uh, that wasn't the case. Now, um, the next part of the story is where do Rubin and Ford fit in? <clears throat> and um, around this time, Rubin and her collaborators start their systematic start study of the spiral galaxies. But their main aim is to see how the, the dynamical properties of galaxies relate to their appearances. That's what she's mainly interested in. She isn't thinking, oh, I'm out there to look for dark matter. Their first paper comes out in 1978 and they're very, very cautious. They say flat rotation curves are a necessary but not sufficient condition for massive halos. But as time goes on, two years later, and they're feeling much more confident, Oh, also, I should mention also in that year, we got more rotation curves from a radio astronomer, Albert Bosmer, a Dutch radio astronomer, who got the best flat rotation curves for a handful of galaxies to date made with a radio observation. So the, the evidence was, was piling up. And so by 1980, Rubin and Ford and their collaborator, um, and Norbert Tonar was saying, the conclusion is inescapable that non-luminous matter exists beyond the optical galaxy. So that's a move forward for them. And another two years later, they're saying the observations are consistent with the presence of virtually non-luminous massive halos. By 1995, 1985, they're referring to these massive halos as being just an accepted phenomena. In fact, Rubin and her collaborators have provided much of the evidence and they've published dozens of high quality rotation curves, enough to convince the most reluctant of skeptics. The problem of what dark matter is, of course, remains unsolved, though many astronomers now think it's in the form of some kind of unknown elementary particles that aren't at all like ordinary matter. Vera herself never became really involved in the question of what dark matter is, and she didn't much like being pressed for an opinion about it. I'm now going to move on to the, to the next little theme, because alongside her love of observing and research, Ruby did have another passion. She wanted women to have a career in astronomy and science on the same terms as men, without discrimination. These are two of the things that she liked to say. There is no problem in science that can be solved by a man that cannot be solved by a woman. And half of all brains are in women. Rubin's activism began in the 1970s when she was in her early 40s. She was never one to rant though, however angry she really felt. Rather, she used to argue her case and gave examples uh, where um, uh, harm and how harm might be done. And she often employed ironic humor. There's a good example of this with, in 1970, she complained to the editor of the prestigious journal Nature about a job advert. This was an Australian job advert, including the information 
that if a woman was appointed, the salary would be lower. She suggested that all male applicants should demand a lower salary, thereby making them just as desirable as the female applicants. A year later, her friend Margaret Burbage sent shockwaves through the American Astronomical Society by declining the Annie Cannon Award for women astronomers. Many women were suspicious that having a special prize for women meant they were properly considered alongside men for other more prestigious awards. And Burbage wrote, it is high time that discrimination in favor of, as well as against women in professional life be removed. Now, Vera felt after this that she could openly express her frustration with the lack of female representation on the council and committees of the AAS. She wrote to one of the council members, um, Donald Osterbrock, uh, who was to represent the women? No one, and apparently no one cared. Well, Vera went on to play a major role in the working group of the AAS that was set up um, and its recommendations ultimately led to the establishment of the permanent committee on the status of women in astronomy, which not only still exists, it's extremely active. A year on though, um, it was in 1972, uh, Vera staged her own protest. This was against the Cosmos Club in Washington its all-male membership consisted of professionals in areas such as science, law, arts and government. And it was an important place for events and networking. But female again, guests weren't invited, weren't allowed through the front door. They had to go in through the ladies' entrance at the back. Vera thought this was very insulting and discriminatory. And when she was invited to have dinner there in the club before giving a lecture she refused and uh, this is what she wrote I will no longer accept the discriminatory practice um, the door policy was changed soon after but it was the start of a long battle in which she took part with Margaret Burbage for um, women to be allowed in as members and uh, she lobbied astronomical organizations and her own employer not to use the facilities of the club. As her reputation and influence grew, Vera campaigned relentlessly in her efforts to achieve female representation. She was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1981. That's the equivalent of the Royal Society in, in the, um, the UK. And that gave more weight to her voice. She told them openly, nowhere in the NAS do we detect a serious concern for enlarging the participation of women. And she put forward, she was, um, she didn't just complain, she put forward lists of well-qualified women, constantly made nominations and suggestions and pointed out anywhere where she thought women were unfairly represented. And in 1999, she wrote this to the NAS, Wow, you've outdone yourselves. Last year, I complained about one meeting that had only one woman speaker. This year, you've proved you can do worse. 21 speakers, all male. And it was not until 2007 that the NAS finally tackled the problem seriously. Um, in addition to her campaigning, Vera also mentored, advised and supported countless individual women and she was honored with several awards for this. A Wendy Friedman, who went on to be the director of the Carnegie Observatories, wrote a moving personal letter to Vera, which I found in the archives. Thanks for speaking out, she said. I often get the feeling that if things are any easier for women like me, it's because women like you have taken the time and energy to help make it so. Well, I hope that what little I've had time to say about Vera Rubin's character and achievements may have persuaded you that she was a remarkable astronomer. But I'm going to tell you some of the thoughts of two women who knew her and her work intimately. The first is Sandra Faber, one of the most distinguished of American astronomers today. 
She was mentored and inspired by Rubin when she started her career. And when Rubin died, Faber wrote this about her achievements, that her work was particularly influential for three reasons. She said, the clarity of her papers, including beautiful illustrations, you've seen some of those. Then a succession of papers enlarged the sample and showed how common flat rotation curves were. And not least, Rubin's presentations at numerous astronomical conferences were clear, direct, and ultimately compelling. And Rubin and Margaret Burbage were twin guiding lights for female astronomers in the 1960s and 1970s. The second woman whose thoughts I want mm -hmm. to share is Vera's astronomer daughter, Judy Young, who tragically died prematurely several years before Vera. In June 2009, there was a special meeting in Kingston, Ontario, to celebrate Vera's life and work. And Judy gave the invited talk at the banquet. She summoned up Vera's life as a love story. Love of astronomy, love of learning, and love of family and friends. She was kind and thoughtful and accepted people as they are. And two of the lessons Judy took from her mother's life were, dedicate yourself to what you're interested in and follow your dream, no matter what the challenges are. And Vera most certainly did both of those things. Well, that's all I have time for tonight. If you would like to read any more, and there's much more about Vera's life um, and um, her, her work. You can find them in Vera Rubin, A Life, which I've written in collaboration with my husband, Simon. Uh, it's published in the United States tomorrow and in the UK on the 26th of February. Uh, and I'm now very happy to answer any questions, if I can. Well, thanks uh, very much, uh, Jacqueline. It's one of the unfortunate things about doing these sorts of webinars that we can't give you a round of applause uh, uh, at the end of lecture. So it just tend to be a little bit, a little bit muted uh, uh, afterwards. But that was an, an, an excellent talk and very interesting, uh, on a very interesting person. Um, if anyone wants to ask any questions, if they could uh, either use the Q and A uh, buttons on Zoom or in the chat. Uh, or if you're watching on YouTube, uh, I'll also be looking at the uh, the chat messages that are on, on YouTube as well. Um, there was one question already on the chat, but I think you probably covered it uh, at one point, and that was the role of Fritz Zwick Zwicky. Um, the question was, wasn't it Zwicky who discovered the rotational curves of our galaxy? Um, but I think in your slide, you mentioned that it was actually the dynamics of the Coma cluster, is that right? It was, yes. Um, Zwicky um, raised the issue of um, and, and invented the expression dark matter um, when he was looking at what, what could hold the coma cluster together. Yes, he wasn't doing rotation curves. Strange silence. Everybody, <laughs> I've, I've answered everybody's possible questions. <laughs> Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable life that, uh, that she had. It's uh, um, amazing that uh, in America, the, um, the uh, uh, place of women, I, I suppose, it was, you know, we look back in the, uh, the 60s and the 70s and there was that recent, recent film um, about uh, the American housewife, which was, uh, I guess, of that same sort of period of the late... Oh, this is uh, America. Mrs. America, yes, that's right, yes. Yes, indeed, indeed. Uh, which uh, yeah. I, I guess played a lot of, was, was very similar in the world of, of, of astronomy. Yeah. Yes, but Vera, Vera did, um, uh, she did struggle, um, uh, but in many ways she was very lucky because she had, <clears throat> she had the support of um, uh, 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 Bob, uh, and also of her, her parents and Bob's parents. But that's not to say that she didn't have to work incredibly hard to get where she was. And they did have four children all, all, all together. Um, and, um, but she, she, formed a, she forged a very individual kind of career. 
um, because she never worked in a university department. No one ever tempted her away to be a big professor in a university. And she said that she absolutely loved working at the DTM where she wasn't under any pressure. She occasionally went and visited universities because she had an enormous sense of, well, enormous sense of duty. And she really um, got excited about talking to students. And um, she, she went and spent a few days here and there in universities and even spent three months as a visiting professor. And she just wrote to Merle Tube, the director, when she got back and said, you know, thank goodness for DTM. I now realize why I love working here. <laughs> and um, uh, her observing schedule was just incredible. We found in the, the, the archives, the files, um, a scrap of paper handwritten in which at some point somebody must have asked her how many nights she'd observed over the last 10 or 20 years. So she kind of scribbled all this stuff out. And it was absolutely astonishing just how much, um, how much time she spent in the dome. There's a number uh, of um, questions coming in now. So um, uh, Pauline asks, can you say any more about her relationship with Alan Sandage? Um, it, was a, it was a friendly relationship. This was kind of interesting because um, there was actually a lot of tension between the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism on the East Coast and the Carnegie Observatories. They're both part of the Carnegie family, but the, the, the Carnegie Observatories and the director and the, the, the people who run it thought they were the astronomers in the Carnegie family. And they thought that um, they were a bit jealous actually that the DTM had got this, um, image tube spectrograph, um, which meant that smaller telescopes could be used as well as the 200 inch. And of course, they were just bringing this spectrograph online at the point in the mid 1960s where quasars and, uh, and related objects were just being discovered and very new. So in, in some ways, um, what the people at um, uh, in California at Palomar, they were really interested in getting their hands on this um, spectrograph. But unfortunately, it appears again from things in the, the, um, uh, the archive that it never really happened because there were kind of squabbles between them. And that was one of the reasons why, why Vera decided to get out of the whole business of observing quasars and distant galaxies and do something quiet where nobody was in competition. But all through that, there are really friendly letters from Sandage and there is no evidence at all that, um, uh, that, that they, they fell out, although their interests drifted apart. Great. Um, Hazel uh, Collett asks, uh, excellent talk, thank you. Um, sorry if I missed it, but uh, what happened to her, her children, uh, apart from one, of course, that sadly passed away? Uh, did they follow her passions? Well, she was very proud of her children and um, her three sons are still living and I've been very grateful, particularly to her youngest son, Alan, who has been very supportive and helpful throughout this project and has been our point of contact uh, with the family. Um, her three sons are two earth scientists and, and one mathematician, all of them very distinguished. And I also should add that she has um, an, an elder sister, Ruth, um, who was a very distinguished lawyer. She is still alive and she also has been very helpful. I had a wonderful conversation with her. Uh, I had a message from uh, Victoria Urban, I think it is. Um, she doesn't say she doesn't have a question, but she'd like to thank you for inviting her to talk today. She's an upcoming hun Hungarian astronomer in Scotland, perhaps. Thanks. I'd like to say hello to, to Victoria. We had an, ex, an email exchange earlier this week uh, and I was delighted to hear from her. I told her about the, um, the webinar and I'm delighted she's been able to join. Uh, the question from uh, uh, R.E. Rosenfield. Uh, could you say a bit more about her Celestial Globe collection, what it meant to her and of course uh, where it ended up? Well, I wish I knew more about this. Um, I understand that 
um, it was dispersed and auctioned off when she when she died or or, or when she went into care. Um, I asked uh, um, Alan Rubin about it, and he he didn't really know very much about it. They knew that she was. Um, I mean, they knew all about it, that, that, that um, she was really keen and that it was one of those things. It was a bit like being a collector of anything, you know, wherever she went in the world. Uh, one of the things she wanted to do was sort of find out whether there was any globe dealer or book dealer where she could go and find something new. And I, and I understand I understand from um, the historian Owen Gingrich that it was a very valuable collection of atlases and globes that, that she had. Um, uh, but unfortunately, it, it, it clearly was dispersed and sold off at some point. A couple of questions uh, from uh, David Swan and Andy are both on the same topic. Um, what do you think her uh, she would have made of the LSST being named after her? Uh, oh, was, was she aware? Was that uh, in the in the offing before she passed away? Do we know? Absolutely not. No, this is a. Um, uh, perhaps we should add for the, those people who don't don't know about this um, uh, the uh, what the the used to be um, I'm struggling now what LS <laughs> LSST used to stand for but uh, it's, it's now for the long the large synoptic, synoptic the large synoptic oh, survey oh, telescope oh. and that's um, now the whole project is now called the Vera C. Rubin Observatory and the LSST has been deemed to stand for something else. The Legacy Survey of um, Space and Time, that's what it is. They had to think of something else for it to stand for. I'm absolutely sure that Vera would have been thrilled. Um, she received quite a lot of honours in her time and um, uh, although she had to turn down a lot of invitations to give talks and so on, she never turned down any of the really attractive invitations. She had about nine honorary degrees and quite a long list of sort of named lectures and so on. So uh, there have been a number of things now that have been named for her um, since her death, which is which is very good. As the, um, the the telescope project, of course, is the, the really, really big one. But um, there's also a, um, a, an, an American Astronomical Society prize. There is a chair um, at the University of um, California. Um, and there is a feature on Mars. It's been named for her. Um, one last question in the queue from uh, John Axton. He says, well, not so much a question as an observation, but yesterday we saw the UAE uh, get to Mars. 75% of the team are, are female, yet the TV press shots of the control room showed mostly men. Apparently in the UAE, men um, regard technology, science and astronomy as low status and prefer banking, etc. Um, so that's all left to, to women. Um, did you have any thoughts on that at all? Well, I suppose our only, my only thoughts uh, can be that um, I hope that, that women all over the world where they are uh, earning the credit will be recognized and given the credit that, that, that they deserve. It's, it's a long haul that is not yet um, completely uh, achieved. We've come a great deal further than where we were when uh, Vera was campaigning, but there is still a way to go, and especially in countries perhaps where women are still less prominent and still don't have equal opportunities. And I'll just mention that um, we've had, um, oh, sorry, here's another question on the chat. Did she ever visit the UK professionally? Um, yes, she did. Um, uh, I know that she visited Cambridge. I know for sure she visited Cambridge because I've actually got a couple of snapshots of her um, uh, sitting in the garden of a, of a neighbour here, um, Judith, Judith Perry, who used to work at the Institute of Astronomy. Um, 
uh, holding forth in the in the garden. And I know she visited the Cavendish Laboratory and talked to the to the radio astronomers. Um, uh, I don't think she came. Oh, and, and of course, she came to receive the gold medal of the she came and received the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society in person. She was the first woman since Caroline Herschel to be given the uh, a gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society. She was much touched by that. Fantastic. Well, thanks uh, very much for the, uh, the talk this evening, Jacqueline. It's, uh, it's been an excellent and, and interesting uh, journey through, uh, through, through the life of, of, of Vera. Um, uh, many thanks again. And uh, again, it's a shame we can't give you a big round of applause, but I'm sure everyone at home will be <laughs> clapping away uh, uh, with, their, with their thanks to you. Well, thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak and, um, and, and just to um, actually promote my book. <laughs> well. Yes, everyone go out and buy the book. <laughs> um, finally, just like to, to thank Dominic, uh, Dominic Ford for uh, doing all of the, the IT magic in the background. Uh, and making this all go very seamlessly, uh, and also to Hazel Collett, who's been organising the... Uh, Indeed. The please, please add my th thanks as, sure. as well for, for everything's gone very, very smoothly, and also to Andy, who um, uh, gave me a rehearsal beforehand so that uh, the technical bits would all go very smoothly. Yeah. So thanks very much, everyone. Um, the forecast for tonight is supposedly clear around here, so... Um, oh. Uh, amazingly, um, though it was actually snowing the last time I went out, so I'm not altogether sure whether that's going to be true across the year in Gloucestershire, but you, you never know, it might clear up in a bit. Um, so um, hopefully if it is clear around you, you might get a chance to go out and do a sub-observing tonight. Um, go and do the, uh, uh, participate in the CPRE star count, the number of stars in Orion. Uh, and, or, uh, or get your telescope out and have a look at a few things in the uh, the moonless sky. Um, so uh, thanks very much again, Jacqueline. Uh, thanks everyone for attending tonight and uh, look forward to seeing you at one of our uh, webinars again 